Okay, so what we're seeing, I think it was um, Cole mentioned it as well as, as me I've, and showed some photos actually of, you know, crops that were like almost as high as people at one time. Um, when we first opened grasslands up for, for cropping, I know in northern New South Wales when grasslands were first opened up for growing cereals, you could get, you could grow wheat um, or various other other cereal crops with 18 or 19 per cent protein with no trouble at all and no fertiliser used at all. So you're thinking, okay, so why is it on the very same farm in the same paddock where once you could get 18 or 19 per cent protein, now we're throwing all this nitrogen on and still struggling to get prime hard, you know, trying to get up like 12, 13 per cent protein, you have to throw a heck of a lot of nitrogen on to get that to happen. Well, as I also mentioned today, organic nitrogen and organic carbon are bound together in the same molecule and we've lost 50 to 80 per cent of the carbon in most of our cropping soils. So the things that we're doing in uh, agriculture are still continuing to reduce those carbon levels. If we keep on doing the same things that we've done for decades, it doesn't matter whether so much whether we cultivate or spray um, spray our weeds out, we're still not having anything green between crops and it's photosynthesis that's going to rebuild soil. So you can't just um, stop using like at the moment those things like urea, uh, MAP and DAP and whatever that's going in under the seed, it's really it's a life support system for trying to grow plants in a dysfunctional soil. You can't turn the life support system off and expect that the plants are going to be able to survive by themselves because they don't have the environment in the soil anymore in which they can survive. So it's going to be a slow process of um, transitioning from where you are now to where you need to be and that's going to involve you're going to have to get some more photosynthesis in there somehow because some, somehow you have to get carbon back into the soil. And I know that in this environment everyone's going to say, well, things won't grow over summer, but, you know, things did grow over summer and even if you're just going to have to start, there are farmers in Victoria now, if we're talking cropping, was it, this is a cropping question? Yeah, okay, so we're talking cropland. Um, at the Vic No-Till Farmers annual conference this year in July um, in Victoria, there was quite a few young farmers there that were like really gung-ho about putting multi-species cover crops in over summer. And you know, the first year that you do it, the crops might only like get this high. <laughs> Don't expect that you're gonna have sunflowers up here or something in the very first year, unless it, you happen to get like a really wet summer. But the next year they'll grow taller and the next year taller. And it's just a slow process of you must put something green in there over summer and don't worry about how much it grows. You're not trying to grow a cash crop and you have to find what is gonna be the thing that's gonna survive best in my climate and a, and a bit of diversity. I mean not just a monoculture, but if it's a, if you're in a really hot, dry place, you might find there'll be things like millets, various millets and things like that that will will survive over some of that. don't even have to produce seed, just something green. And as I said, even if it only grows, you know, 20 centimetres and dies, it's it's done something while it, while it was growing. The other thing about soil moisture over summer is that there was this belief that if you had something green over summer, it's going to utilise moisture that should be saved um, for the follow-on crop. Any time up till, any rain that falls from harvest time up till the end of February is going to have totally evaporated before you plant a crop, whenever that may be, um, April, May, June, whatever. Anything that fell before the end of February is never ever gonna make it through to your crop. So if there is any rain at all that falls between harvest and the end of February, why not have something there that's gonna grow and use it, even if it uses it all? that you can't save that water. So in March you can save 20 or 30 percent of the rain that falls and then by the time you get to April you'll save probably most of the rain that falls. But you, you've got more chance of saving the rain that falls if you've got soil that's porous and well aggregated and it's not going to be porous and well aggregated unless it's got carbon in it. So you really must, the secret to getting off fertilisers probably sounds like a tangential answer <laughs> is to have something green over summer to rebuild your organic carbon levels because that will be linked with nitrogen. Your carbon and your nitrogen always move together. So you get more carbon in your soils, you'll have more nitrogen in there when it comes through that liquid carbon pathway. So somehow or another you have to, and then, you, and then you're slowly going to wind back on your ferts because you really won't need them. And again, when you're winding back on anything or when you're doing anything at all, doesn't matter what it is, 
try it in different strips. You know, like if the agronomist says you need 80 units of N something, well, try 60 and 80 and 100 and, or, or even a 40 and, and just try some strips that have got maybe none. But you don't ever need to go back to zero nitrogen, really. A little tiny bit of organic, a little bit of inorganic nitrogen like urea or um, it's probably not the best form, but something like sulphate of ammonia is probably a lot kinder than that or even something that's in MAP or DAP will just actually primes the nitrogen fixing cycle. We're not sure why, but a little bit of inorganic nitrogen is better than none, but you don't want to have too much. Uh, and in lots and lots of times where we've, like when I was at the university and we were measuring nitrogen dynamics in soil, you know, there'd be farmers would be putting out 175 or 200 kilos of urea, surface spreading it, like this was in cultivated soils on the Liverpool Plains, working it in five weeks before a crop, spending like 90 to 100 thousand dollars or something on nitrogen fertiliser and then when it came to the day they sowed their crop we'd go in and measure the nitrogen and there was nothing. There was not one molecule of that nitrogen still in their soils and they just spent $100,000 on nitrogen fertiliser. Why did they work it in five weeks before? Well, because as Cole said, it's toxic if you put it in under the seed. So, you know, nitrate, which is an, a form of inorganic nitrogen, is carcinogenic at two parts per million. We should not have nitrate in our soils, in our plants, in our water, in our bodies, in animals' bodies. We just shouldn't have nitrate in the system. So there's a whole lot of reasons for getting inorganic nitrogen out of the system, as well as the fact that it costs lots of money and doesn't necessarily result in increased profit. And I mean, Graham was talking about, you know, looking at, if I spend money on this, is it making me money? I mean, even if we take the ecology out of the system and just look at the economics of it, doesn't stack up to use all that fertiliser. But your solution is probably not what, so much what you were thinking. <laughs> well, now that everyone said we've, we've realised we need green and we need green for longer, the answer to getting off your fertilisers is actually to have green and to have green for longer. Well, actually, we'll get Cole to answer that because he's basically gone from 100 and something kilos down to 20 or 15 or something. But, but if you're going to wind back, you must have your green things in there as well. And also think about some companion plants maybe in your, in your crops too, which is something we haven't talked about today. We haven't really talked about much about multi-species cropping or about companion planting. We could, we could have a whole day talking about getting diversity in there. And monoculture is not good for your soil because you need a diverse range of functional groups of microbes and you're not going to get a diversity in microbial groups if you've just got one kind of plant. So you need to think about companions with your cash crop, a multi-species cover crop, and winding back at the same time. So I'll just hand over to Cole about, about the winding back. Yeah, um, you, as Chris said, I started with 100 kilos of DAP under crops. Very normal, and most of that district still using that. Um, and like I said in my talk, this was just madness, but that, that sort of rates on. So I, I wound it back over years, at 80, and, and then you know, you know, 10, and, and I did trials, like you just just put a strip through a paddock and try it. I mean, we don't do that enough. You know, keep, keep your 100 there if that's what you're doing, but put a strip through at 80 and, and 60 and see what happens. I, most of the time you'll be surprised, there'll be no difference between 60 and 100. So I, I wound it back over years. I keep the risk out of it, make sure you're not going to go broke while you're doing this. Now, now I'm putting 30 kilos on, which is about seven, six to seven kilos or less than that, five, five to seven kilos of, of, of nitrogen and, 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 and phosphorus in that. So it's not very much uh, at, at all. And, and the crops, after doing that, over a period of time, the crops got better, not worse. Um, so. Like I said, it doesn't fit the conventional agronomy model, but so we maybe we need to relearn all this stuff. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that. I gave you an example this morning of the Haggerty's in Western Australia. They just let whatever wanted to come up in the summertime come up and just didn't spray it. Um, and they've ended up, in fact, with some really interesting uh, annual native grasses warm season annual native grasses. That's something we didn't mention today. We talked about warm season perennial grasses. They've got warm season native annual grasses coming up that no one could identify. No one had seen them before and I'm going, well, they're native. Um, and some of them were annual paspaliniums actually. And that they've, they use compost extract and vermi liquid on their seed. They don't use any nitrogen fertiliser or any phosphorus fertiliser. 
um, and they use a liquid um, like a folia. They just come back when the crops come up, they come across with, I mean they're talking five litres per hectare of compost extract in in water, but like five litres of the actual compost extract. It's really, really low rates. It's just incredible. But they have occasionally decided just to run a strip through of fertiliser to see if they get a response to fertiliser. So they're not using fertiliser at all. Um, they're using seed dressings, like biological seed dressings. What happens if we put a strip of you know, 100 kilos of MAP or DAP or something through the paddock, do we get a yield response to it? And they've never been able to get a yield response to fertiliser. So obviously what they're doing is working because their crop doesn't even respond to fertiliser. Gabe Brown stopped using nitrogen fertiliser in 2008. I didn't get a chance to talk about Gabe. Did any of you come to Gabe's workshops when he was in Australia last year? No, one couple, not many people. Um, when we asked that same question over in New South Wales and Victoria, about half the room put their, put their hands up. Um, you'll see him on YouTube, but he has increased his carbon level sixfold. So he's gone from about 1% to about 6% organic carbon, and he stopped using nitrogen fertiliser in 2008, and his corn is out yielding all his neighbours' corn, and, he, and corn is a really heavy user, so theoretically, of nitrogen. So obviously his soils are able to utilise, to fix all of the nitrogen that his corn needs, but he's like really into multi-species covers, um, animal integration in, onto his cropland, and um, all of the things in fact, if you haven't heard of him, please Google him and, and uh, look at some of his YouTube videos. So it can be done, and there's people in Australia doing it, there's people overseas doing it, um, and it, again, it's coming down to photosynthesis and diversity. I'm not sure whether nitrates are toxic to soil microbes, but they're certainly toxic to plants, and they're certainly toxic to animals that eat the plants. And you know what? We're animals, and we eat plants, and we eat animals that eat plants. So we have huge amounts of nitrate in our system, um, or we can potentially. I think, Graham, did you talk about the blood? Yeah, you were talking about ammonia and blood, the blood urea nitrogen. Yeah. Like, it, like if stock eat. Uh, forage that's high in nitrates, like if it hasn't been converted to complete protein, what will happen is if there's nitrate in the soil ecosystem, it's, it's, um, it's taken up by passive flow. Plants can't uh, eliminate it. They can't, dis um, what's the word, discriminate. If there's nitrate there, it's water soluble. It becomes part of the water, the soil solution and it's taken up by passive flow. It gets into plants whether they want to have it in them or not. If they're not photosynthesising fast enough, and, and Graham talked about young plants that aren't, don't have enough carbohydrate to actually be able to convert that nitrate into complete protein, so it stays as non-protein nitrogen, as funny protein, then animals consume that. They end up with high blood urea nitrogen levels, high milk urea nitrogen levels. If they've got calves on them, then the calves end up with high um, ammonia levels and it will can lead to all, or it can lead to death. You actually kill the calves. But what about all the people that are drinking the milk from the supermarket? Hello, that they buy in the carton. They're not realising how high the nitrate levels are now. We know that China has been sending milk back from New Zealand because the nitrate levels in the milk have been toxic to humans, and yet in New Zealand nobody's being told about that, and people are consuming that. One of the things that nitrate does in the human body, as well as all the other issues like affecting your liver, etc., is cause infertility. So we've got human infertility now running at about 30%, 30% on average of young couples in Australia are having difficulty conceiving. Has it got something to do with high nitrate levels in the milk? I don't know, but we've, you hear stories of women that have gone on to organic milk and have been able to, to conceive. So, you know, like nitrate is an issue. Maybe not so much for soil microbes, but it's an issue for plants, animals and people. We don't want nitrate in our food chain. We just don't want it in the food chain. I could answer that, but Cole would do a better golf job. <laughs> In this environment, start with a, a winter a winter mix, winter multi-species mix. Now remember, these, these multi-species crops can be used for many things. The better way to, make, to generate profit from them is graze them. So it's not about... Sorry, just to clarify, so I'm on a grazing property. Yeah, you're on yeah, a grazing property, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Now, 
I use mixes, and it doesn't matter too much. You need a grass type plant in there, like oats, wheat, barley, we're talking about winter. Um, you need a leafy type plant uh, in there, which can be the brassica species, um, turnip, uh, depending on, on, on soil structure, maybe a, a radish, a tillage radish, a dock on radish. Uh, so the legumes that are put in there are often uh, peas, you could put lupins, um, vetch uh, are, are generally in that mix. Um, uh, what have I missed? Um, uh, must have missed some. But providing there's sort of more than four, ten, it's only limited by imagination really, and what grow in your environment. Like you get, if you, this, this is an area where, where uh, chickpeas are grown, whatever's cheap, uh, chickpeas could be thrown in there. Uh, so whatever you've got that, that's, it, we, we want to be getting uh, low cost seed. Don't worry about chasing these wonderful new breed, breeds of plants. Mostly they're not much better anyway, probably worse. So whatever's cheap, whatever you've got in your silo, <laughs> um, and, and, and some as a mix. Uh, and uh, the greater the mix, the better. Uh, I'll just well, add to that, we can tailor mixes for specific things, like you can tailor a mix which is really good stock feed, you can tailor a mix that, that is really good for poor structured soil, and to do that you add more, more turnips, more, more radish, more of those, we can tailor a mix that will increase ground cover, you know, to increase ground cover you put more cereals in there, like, like for example cereal rice really good, um, wheat is good, so you, you increase the, the, about the ratio of, the, of those to, do, to achieve different goals. Yeah, when we run these, this training, what we do is we do that resource concern that you're trying to address and then we look at what the paddock is and what its constraints are and get some feedback on that, what weeds are there and then what machine have you got, all those sort type of things. So we actually address all those barriers. What I'm thinking, if you've got a uh, C3 pasture, so a winter growing pasture uh, with introduced grasses, the winter mix will be really hard to get to work. Now the issue we have in the Mediterranean environments is we don't necessarily always get uh, summer rainfall. So it'd be as those grasses shut down, you'd be then putting in your summer mix. But it's only if you get moisture. So you can't, you've got to lower that rainfall risk. But that, yeah, that might not make a, <laughs> make a spring. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I think that, yeah, it's just that sort of thing that you've, yeah, what are you trying to achieve? We, we get people to fill out the form, send us the photos, do that type of stuff, and then we provide advice back on that mix. So, yeah, what is your limiting constraint and your resource concern? So I'm going to put Col on, <laughs> um, a bit of pressure on Col here because we've just been saying that we need warm season plants here too. So, what would you recommend, Dave? You put your summer, you put your winter mix in, you've grazed it, so you got your money back from grazing it so you haven't lost anything. Now now we're here and we're going to go into summer, what are we going to put in? If you have that winter mix, a, a way to fix degraded soils is to start layering a winter mix and then a summer mix, layer it st straight on top of it. Ideally, it, zero till, I didn't, didn't touch on that, or direct, direct drilled is far, far better way of growing it. But we know now that we can fix degraded soils, poor structured soils, dysfunctional soils, as in soils that aren't cycling nutrients, very, very rapidly by, by layering one, um, a winter, a, a winter multi-species mix uh, well, uh, on top of a summer mix, or vice versa, put a summer mix in, then a winter one again. By the time you get round to summer again, you've just about fixed that paddock. Um, it it ha can happen really, really quickly. Now, uh, 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 a mix that would do it go well here, and, and it's a bit difficult without knowing, you know, all, all the constraints that you've got. Millet is always a good one to use because it's a tough thing. The seed is really cheap. You might find out by now. Now I'm, I'm really tired. I, I don't like spending much money, so re, re, really cheap, and it's usually quite readily available. Um, better, I think, in this environment than say a forage sorghum. I think it'll fit better here. It's a bit more drought tolerant, and, and it's not as expensive. Now, but not millet on its own. You want some, something like cow peas would be a good thing to include with that. Further north, they use lab lab beans, but I think that might you might be a bit too far south here. So, you, you, and, and so we want other things as well. Um, 
southern part of South Australia here, you, you, you probably can get something like a, a, a tillage radish, dicot radish that will grow through the, 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 the summer uh, and a turnip, but not as you go further north in the hotter, hotter environments. Um, sunflowers are always really good to include uh, as well. and. Um, uh, Sunflowers are interesting in that they've got a big taproot on them and they're accumulators of phosphorus. They, they will cycle it and, and make phosphorus available. The other, um, the other one is... Um, 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 oh, God. No, I've got the cover of the brassicas. I'll think of it in a minute. Yeah, but, yeah, there's a, there's quite, there's a few in there that, that, that you, you, you can use. Um, no, you wouldn't be sowing mung beans down here. That's, uh, yeah. Someone's sowing mung beans down here, are they? Mung beans can be included if they grow here. Yeah. Just as before you ask that question, I just wanted to add something to what Cole said. There's a farmer in Western Australia at, uh, oh, I've the name of this place, out near Wave Rock anyway. Um, so it's pretty hot and dry out there where he is. And he sowed millet, prozo millet, and he didn't have livestock originally, and the prozo millet just kept reseeding. It just came up every year by itself. Now he's introduced cattle, so like on a gistman, he's bringing cattle in. So I'm not quite sure what will happen to the millet, but I think he's got a big enough seed bank of it now that it will just keep coming up. So that's another option if you weren't grazing it to just put something in that will self-regenerate. Just thought I'd mention that because millet really is a fantastic thing for summer. I just add something there too. I'm, I missed the ploughing. Uh, the, the, sorry, how you sow it. If you are still ploughing um, and, and working country, it's not good. But <laughs> but but it, it, you can still sow those multi-species mixes. I, I mentioned zero tilling, but um, you want to move away from from ploughing and working country. But if that's what you're doing and, and you can't move away straight away because of costs or anything else, still put those multi-species mixes in. It'll 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 start to drive it and you'll generate income off it. But then think about how you can wean yourself off ploughing and get into direct drilling or zero tilling. Never too late. Um, <laughs> millet will germinate on about 16 degrees ground temperature. Cowpeas need to be a little bit higher. Um, probably yesterday would have been a great time to have it to sell to have sold it. <laughs> <laughs> If you've got a thick latch, thatch layer, you, you really need a disc planter, uh, a disc seed drill. Now, I'll just go back a bit. There's a couple of problems with, uh, with all, all types of, of seeding equipment. Disc planters, disc drills are really good, but if you've got poor structured soil, like soil as hard as rock, you, you almost always get a poor result with them because there's no tilth under the seed, there's no seed bed. Uh, so if you've got really hard compacted soil, you're better off, off with a knife point. Gabe Brown would chuck rocks at me for saying that. Uh, but, but, but that's the reality of it. Um, I started with a knife point because I had hard compacted soils. So, but, but if you're... Um, question about, about um, uh, using a roller crimper. If we... And this is moving into, into actual cover crops. Uh, if we want to terminate a crop, we can use use animals or herbicide or a roller crimper. Now, a roller crimper is a big, uh, basically a tube, you know, a steel tube. Um, I was going to say two foot in diameter. What's that? Um, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about that big. Um, with with ple uh, steel welded across it, about about 10 mil uh, wide. Yeah, sort of 100 mil high, and what they do is crush the stems of the of of, of the crop you've sown. Um, they're six inches apart. Crush the stem all the way up and lay it flat on the ground. So you can, it will kill the crop and terminate it, and then come in and then drill another crop into the, into that. So basically, you're creating a, a, a little like in a vegetable patch, mulch in a vegetable patch that you're planting your crop into. This is the way that cropping needs to go. I mean, the, the conventional guys really need to know that and learn that. The conventional cropping fellas, because it's the only way you're going to be able to continue to crop uh, like continuously. So, and that, that, that is actual cover cropping that, that, that the American fellows are using. It needs to be adopted more, more in this country. The main problem with using a disc drill, if, if you've laid that, that, that material down you, you, with, with, with a roller crimper, you have to sow in the direction that it's been laid down. That, that's, that's the main challenge. 
Uh, and if you if you're laying a crop down, uh, uh, terminating it, you, you do need a disc, a, a, a disc plant or a disc drill. Um, and the other one I mentioned, make sure the soil is, is not too hard for a disc drill, for a disc. Uh, uh, and I guess they're, they're the main things that I've seen. Got a thumbs up that one. Could I just add something though? I mean, if it was possible to integrate livestock to graze it. Um, then you haven't got those issues and you've still got the base of the plant still like got the roots and everything it's still attached so there's not so many issues with things clogging up your planting equipment and that so um, there's huge benefits to integrating livestock which we didn't really get a chance to discuss today in terms of manure and um, urine and everything improving soil microbiomes like they really stimulate the soil microbiome so even people that were dedicated croppers that were saying we'll never ever have livestock again have actually figured out ways of getting livestock back in to graze a multi-species cover crop to get the money back that it cost you to put the crop in and improve the soil at the same time and it's an extra income stream you know there's and huge advantages for soils like soils have evolved with plants and animals we talked a lot today about green plants but animals are a very important part of that too yeah, just to, to add to, to what Christine said, see, I use the animals instead of the roller crimper for mine. I've got mine is a perennial cover cropping or pasture cropping, and the animals are a vital part of it. But we, we so the animals are, are partly terminating it um, and, and, and creating mulch. So yeah, you can and, and you can use a combination of animals and a roller crimper. Um, you can always use a herbicide as well, but you're better off to try and move away from that at, as, as much as we can, like herbicide. Um, and, and we can do it without herbicide uh, uh, like Terminator. I'm going to hand this to Graham in a minute um, because I, I reckon the, the best thing you can do is, is graze that, those areas. Um, you know, you, you, most of you here on this table, from what I can gather, are small landholders. You know, it, it's, too co it, it, it's not cost effective enough to, to do that. The other thing too, uh, in relation to, is, is to, um, uh, those seeds we're talking about that we, in, in that are all an annual forage plants. They don't have any mechanism to self-sow. Like uh, native, native plants, native perennial plants have a mechanism to sow themselves in the ground. They've got awns on them to sow themselves. So that's how that works. But most annual uh, cropped species d don't have that. So you need some soil over them. So I'd suggest that your best way to, to do that is to, is to manage it with grazing. Uh, Chris, on, on a lot of the places we've worked with, like in the Southern Tablelands in New South Wales that are very rocky, they usually recover incredibly quickly because they haven't been ploughed. So people would say, oh, this is my worst country, and then two years later it was their best. And so, yeah, so the rocks sort of don't seem to worry the livestock as much as we think, and uh, there's usually good seed banks in there. So I'd be just doing some pra uh, some practice areas and then just focusing on that sort of grazing. How can I, how can I get this sort of um, to be grazed, you know, a couple of times a year or whatever, and and then monitor it and compare it to you know, those recovery areas. I always say I work from about Ningen down to Hobart, sort of, and sort of over to Clare, sort of is my thing. But we work out at, at Cobar, and the grazing and that all works there as well. So high rainfall, low rainfall. Um, I got sent photos this morning, and um, uh, Lachlan Mabry, sort of on the bottom of the mallee there, and uh, his dad, he came to a day with Colin I. And I put in the stipe on the newsletter. So he came for one day and he went home and made more money out of the grazing than his dad did out of cropping. And, and so I wrote in it, either Colin and I are getting better or he's very clever. <laughs> like so. And let, let the stiper members go for that one. So, but yeah, so we haven't found it. And that was like, I called it the dunes and they got upset. But to me, it was like on the sand dunes, the deep, deep sands. And he's put that back to perennial grass now just with grazing. Um, he did do some cover cropping as well. Um, Andrew Mosley, Andrew and Megan at Cobar, they've used some um, sort of like a uh, pasture cropping technique to regenerate all that back into grassland. So they, they have these fantastic big paddocks now that are just covered in perennial grass. So yeah, we, we believe that most of these areas were grassed. Um, everyone always argues sort of thing, but they, 
when you, when you change the practices, they come back. So, yeah, so we do high rainfall, low rainfall, good soils. You know, like it's just that sort of I'm lucky to live in a good area. So, uh, James, sorry, um, I just saw Jeff. So, yeah, I just had a quick question about liming. Um, I think the general consensus was that if the soil is healthy, it'll stabilise at a, a decent pH, but if it's really acidic, is it still best to kickstart it with liming, or is, can you spend your money better elsewhere? Oh, we, all, we can all have a go. <laughs> um, do you know, what we're trying to do with all this is actually, a, you know, focus what's going to bring us more profit out of the business. I have never seen the liming, you know, like I don't want to steal Cole's thunder, but he, he's got this research that just shows that it's incredible how the function increasing changed the calcium availability. We don't see that as a problem. Um, I tend to be a bit different in that I'm, I'm not a big one on the, the plants or indicator species. I was on a panel with um, Peter Andrews and everyone's talking about how these weeds are indicators. And when it got to me, I just said, yeah, they're an indicator you can't manage. But that didn't go so well. So yeah, so I, I, again, I, again, what I'd be going for would be a, a practice area. Change that, see what happens. We know as you increase landscape function, you make calcium available. So that's a much safer, lower risk, more profitable way than putting lime on. So. There were, I'll, I am going to pass this to Cole, because this is... <laughs> but there was an experiment done, I think it was Department of Air, Western Australia, Esperance Sand Plain, where they, um, the pH, I think, was pretty low, was something like 3.8 for pretty much battery acid. And they did, um, they actually compared liming it to sowing kaikuyu and then sowing kaikuyu and lime. And I think like three years down the track, the one that they limed had gone from, say, 4 to 4.2, and the one that they'd um, put kaikuyu on had gone from 4 to 4.8. So it was far, far better just with the kaikuyu than just with lime. And then when they'd done kaikuyu and lime, I think it was still 4.8. So the extra lime didn't actually even help the kike. A like, kike will tolerate very acid soils anyway. So I think it's probably a matter of finding plants that will tolerate low pH soils and the plants themselves are going to bring the pH back up more so than the lime. So that was a fairly definitive experiment. I don't know whether you want to say about what's happened on your place, Cole, but I mean, they, they were measurements that I think, well, some of the ones I took, that what we found on Colin's place was that his calcium had doubled, more than doubled in a really, available calcium had doubled in a really short amount of time and he had tons and tons of calcium in the soil. So just one comment I'd like to say, make about calcium. If you actually, I've mentioned this morning that your soil is minerals. That's what it's made from. There are thousands of tons of minerals, thousands of tons, like 8,000 tons, for example, in the top, you know, 30 centimetres of your soil per hectare, 8,000 tons per hectare of minerals. And the most abundant of those are, are silicon, is the most abundant, then iron and aluminium will be the next two. You hope not in an available form. You hope that they're all going to be bound up with something else um, because you don't want lots of available iron and lots of available aluminium. And the fourth one is calcium. It's the fourth most abundant mineral in your soil. You should never need to be adding it. But it's not going to be available. It's going to bind with something else. Um, it's not going to be available unless you have microbial activity to, to release it. So even soils that are formed from limestone, like around Mount Gambier and, and other areas, and I think you've got calcareous soils quite, quite, quite a way through here, huge, massive amounts of carbon, uh, massive amounts of calcium, sorry, but you send the soil away for a soil test and often the availability of the calcium will be really low. So it's a matter of getting the biological activity there to, to uh, release that. Yeah, there's not much I can add to that, but, <laughs> but just quickly, what, what I, I do on, on if going to people's places which have got acidic soils, don't go putting, I, I don't know if I'm helping a, 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 someone on their property, it, it, but encourage the plants that are there to grow, the ones that are all already tolerating those acidic soils, and if you are going to plant anything, make sure it'll grow in that soil type, in other words, don't don't grow something that wants to die on your on your soil type. Grow something that actually wants to live and be there, and, and then and then, as Chris said, then it'll start to drive it anyway, and, and it'll start to move it, move it forward. Okay.
Okay, we've got one, oh, sorry. One, sorry, one more comment about lime. WA Department of Ag recommendations used to be one tonne of lime per hectare, then it went up to two, and there's some places now they're recommending 10 tonnes of lime per hectare. So is it working, or do they need to do something different? Have you got any cropping equipment, like, no. at all? You've got neighbours. you got neighbours, neighbours, okay. There's no doubt that some of the multi-species crops, like forage crops, can speed that process up and produce more stock feed in those feed gaps, so it'll do all of that, uh, and fix all that, many of those soil constraints. Now, uh, in areas, and we haven't mentioned it here now, yet today, and probably should, in areas that you know, you're trying to do these things and you're not getting a, a response with uh, pre recruitment or, 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 uh, or native grass, or na perennial, sorry, I just say perennial grasses returning, you, we may need to add them. I mean, you may need. You, the best thing is to, is to certainly continue to try to, to get them back naturally. Yeah, okay, we'll keep going with that. So putting a crop into that, like a pasture crop type of crop, yeah, will we'll stimulate seed. But just while, while we're on this, if if we, we, you, you need to plant something, the standard stuff has been, you know, phalaris and, and ryegrass and all of those types of things, which, which aren't warm season grasses, and we know these were warm season grasslands. We may need to put some things in, like, like they've done in Western Australia, and I can send that some of that information on if you want to uh, send it out to people uh, of, the, of the results of what's happening in Western Australia. Planting warm season uh, grasses, perennial grasses, uh, and, and, then, and then sowing crops into them. Um, but you, you, we, you can sow them, but, but that's the, the last resort uh, you know, if, if nothing's happening. I don't know whether that answered your question or not, but yeah. Actually, Kyle, I'll just add to this for well, <laughs> I've got a second. Um, there's a group in uh, Western Australia that's a farmer group called Evergreen. At one stage they had 600 farmer members, so it's, it's like it's a grassroots, well, very grassroots, because Evergreen is all about sowing perennial grasses. And if you, you'll find their website, but they also have the Evergreen mixes, so they have their warm season pasture mixes that you can buy from them. And it's um, it's see that you know they've been experimenting with this for 20 or 30 years at least now, so they've got it down pretty much pat. They've got a whole uh, program for planting it and all that sort of thing. So Evergreen, uh, check them out. They've, and, and it's farmer driven, farmer based, not for profit, and they've done a fantastic job in revegetating Western Australia. Just to add to that, the reason why we're talking about Western Australia here is because it's very similar climate to here. You know, it's a Mediterranean climate, it fits here, uh, so, and you have that data from Western Australia, Department of Ag data and the evergreen work, so I mean, it, it's relevant to here. That's why we keep mentioning Western Australia.